Hello everyone and welcome to today's Lab Tools webinar. I'm Catherine Noydell, Scientific Technical Editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Dr. Sean Downing and Dr. Chris Infino, will be discussing the obstacles associated with developing biomarker strategies and the multiplex immunofluorescent solution that improves the assessment of tumour immune interactions. We like our webinar to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and our speakers will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Ask a Question tab and type your query into the question box located on the bottom left of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. Our webinar platform is user-friendly. You can expand the presentation window by simply clicking on the diametrically opposed arrows in the upper right-hand corner. This will maximise the display within your screen. The webinar will be archived on the scientist website and we'll send you the link by email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, Ultraview. Ultraview provides researchers and scientists with multiplex biomarker assays for tissue phenotyping and digital pathology. Ultraview's in situplex technology eliminates the need for assay development and enables scientists to unmask and analyze the true biological context of tissue samples. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to targeted CD3 activation in cytotoxic T cells, and we have posted these in our resource list located on the left side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sean Downing. As the Director of Customer Engagement at Ultraview, Dr. Downing oversees the services laboratory, providing custom assays to Ultraview customers and the FAL team. Sean has implemented pathology workflows at several companies in work spanning both proteomics and genomics. Prior to Ultraview, he established and ran Perkin Elmer's CRO laboratory, offering a menu of TSA-based staining services. Previously, Sean was one of the principal inventors of the first to market pan cancer NGS test at Foundation Medicine. He was a postdoc and junior faculty member at Harvard Medical School with appointments at Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Downing? Thank you very much. Um, so, for those who don't know me, um, I actually am responsible for the scientific side of the commercial operations at Ultraview. So not only does the services lab report into me, but the field application scientist team, as well as our newly formed pathology and biomarker analytics team. Today I want to take just a few minutes and describe Ultraview uh, to you, our products and services, before we hear from our um, guest speaker. So Ultraview started off looking at the field of multiplexing technologies and wanted to provide an alternative solution to what was currently available. And here are the four tenets that we believe all multiplexing technologies should offer for your consideration. The first is a high level uh, multiplexing. I really, what this means is that you want to be able to do multiplexing across a wide variety of samples using a wide variety of markers. There are certainly other um, multiplexing options out there, but we feel that having pre-optimized assays that are kit-based that you can open and run uh, and get results in the same day is very important. If you look at the upper right, we also believe in workflow compatibility. We believe that you should have a wide variety of options for the instrumentation that you use. Uh, from stainers to scanners and to image analysis platforms. So you can see there that we actually have a number of scanners a, a, in, that can be used to image the slides. We also believe that imaging should be done on whole slides. We believe that regions of interest potentially bias the data so that you really should do whole slide imaging and whole slide analysis that will actually allow you to really interrogate the slide in the sample and get as much information from it as possible. In addition, you want a technology that will allow you to co-localize markers on a particular cell type. Um, ideally, co-localizing a number of markers on the same side of the compartment, such as the plasma membrane. This will allow you to identify cell types 
through positive identification. Um, there are a number of recent reports indicating that there are rare and atypical cell types that would not be discovered by using a single marker to determine what a cell is. So with that, I'd like to describe some of the content that AltaView provides. Namely, if you think of the interactions in immuno-oncology centered around a T cell, in this instance it's actually a cytotoxic T cell, the cytotoxic T cell interacts with a number of cells within the tumor microenvironment, particularly tumor cells, regulatory T cells, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, macrophages, and other antigen-presenting cells, in this case, uh, dendritic cells. So UltraView is actually a content and reagents provider. And as part of that content, we have prescribed kits, which actually look at specific cellular phenotypes and cellular interactions. And so on the right-hand side, you can see a number of kits that we have released or are about to release that actually look at these interactions and, and identify these cell types uh, through staining methods and analysis. So you can see that we actually have two kits which are looking at the PD-1 and PDL one axis, uh, another one which looks at professional antigen presenting cells, and one that looks at T cell activation. And we have two kits which are about to be released. One is actually a regulatory T cell kit and one looking at myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Again, keeping in mind that it's all centered around this access of the cytotoxic T cell within the tumor microenvironment. So how does UltraView's technology work? As I said, it's actually a kit that uses an assay that has already been pre-optimized, so there's no assay development. The kits are actually ready to use. You can plug and play, uh, either standing manually or in an automated fashion. And really what this does is this actually takes multiplex immunohistochemistry back to a state in which it is much more akin to a standard immunohistochemistry assay. By that I mean that there is a single antigen retrieval step. So there isn't any cyclings or strippings that actually occur. In fact, you just perform one antigen retrieval step. And because we actually use DNA barcoded antibodies and we do not rely on a secondary antibody, all of the antibodies actually have a unique genetic fingerprint. And we're going to use that later in the assay to actually detect those markers and those specific antibodies. But because of that, that actually allows us to perform a single staining step and where all the antibodies are actually placed onto the sample at a single time. Unlike some other um, technologies which have DNA barcoded antibodies, we actually have an amplification method. And so once we've actually performed a single entrance retrieval step and the single staining step, we actually perform a single amplification step. This is not PCR-based. What we actually do is create single-stranded DNA from the barcode that's basically composed of tandem repeats. This is actually a very gentle process. It actually requires just a low level of heat. Um, and that way, all of the markers or all the barcodes are amplified at the same rate at the same time. This actually preserves the ratio of the expression levels between markers in order for you to com do comparative analysis between two markers. So once you've actually performed the single entry retrieval step and the single staining step and the single amplification step, you actually can now come in with your fluorescently labeled probes that actually have a sequence complementary to the barcodes. So now this relies on the DNA hybridization, again, a very gentle technology, which allows you to actually bind the probes to the extended and elongated barcodes and thus detect all four signals plus a nuclear counter stand at the same time. So in an assay which takes just over five hours, you can actually perform your multiplex immunofluorescence step and start scanning your slides. And it basically allows you to get results in a single day. Now for those customers that may not want to purchase kits and perform the uh, assay themselves or may want more of a custom assay, not necessarily those in the prescribed content of the kits. We actually have a services lab, and the services lab actually will engage customers on multiple levels. And primarily here, we actually could take on staining of samples with our kits for the customer, or we could actually develop custom assays uh, and custom content for all the customers and either run the samples in-house or potentially provide those custom reagents to the customer.
And basically our services lab actually does an assay development step where we compare the unconjugated antibody in a DAB to a, the conjugated antibody in the DAB assay to make sure that using the gold standard we have not affected the uh, efficacy of the antibody. Then we actually put all of those single plex assays, once we've developed them with the barcode and the single plex uh, in situ plex assay using our technology, we actually combine them into a panel. And once that panel has been developed and approved by the customer, we actually then move on to stain in the customer samples and we can actually perform image analysis. So with that, that actually is just a very brief overview of UltraView, our um, technology, our kits, and our services lab, and how we actually approach multiplex immunofluorescence. So really it's about having an ease of use with a kit that you can just open up and apply today, ideally an equipment that's already in your lab. You may already have a stainer or a scanner and image analysis, image analysis software. And this allows you to easily implement workflows in multiplex immunofluorescence to really do high throughput uh, analysis of large sample sets. And that's actually all I have for you today. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Downing. As a reminder to our audience, you may ask questions at any time using the question box, and our panel will have an opportunity to respond after our next speaker. And that next speaker is Dr. Kristin Fino. Kristin Fino is a scientist in the Pharmacodynamic Assay Development and Implementation section at Laidoff Biomedical NCI Frederick. Her work involves developing and validating fit for purpose assays and clinical trials in the developmental therapeutics program at the NCI. She utilizes state-of-the-art imaging techniques to analyze the performance of putative anti-cancer agents and therapeutic interventions with the goal of determining a link between drug regimen, target effect, and biological tumor response. Kristen has a PhD in cellular and molecular biology from Penn State University. Prior to joining Laidoff Biomedical NCI Frederick, she was a postdoctoral scholar at Penn State University in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and in the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Fino has research experience in the field of immunotherapy and immunology with numerous publications. Dr. Fino? Oh, yes, hi. Thank you for that introduction. Um, oh, there's my slides. Um, so first off, I want to start off with an introduction, um, an introduction to the, uh, the group that I work for. Um, I work for the Pharmacodynamic Assay Development and Implementation Section, or also known as PADIS. Um, we develop and validate fit-for-purpose assays in, for clinical trials in the Developmental Therapeutics Program. And we do this by utilizing state-of-the-art imaging techniques to analyze the performance of putative anti-cancer agents and therapeutic interventions with the goal of determining a link between drug regimen, target effect, and biological tumor response. Um, within PADIS, I am part of the Immuno PD project team, um, and we develop, validate, and deploy uh, pharmacodynamic biomarker assays for the division of cancer treatment and diagnosis, uh, diagnosis-sponsored cancer uh, clinical trials. Um, our goal right now is to develop a robust quantitative uh, multiplex multiplex immuno-oncology immunofluorescence assay for CD8 T cells and their activation status um, in relationship to tumor tissues in formalin fixed and paraffin embedded biopsies um, from patients receiving immunotherapy. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to the workflow of our assays. Um, this is the workflow of the assay we're currently developing and what we've assays that we've developed in the past. Um, we work with specimens collected under an SOP that we've developed over the years. Um, these are typically our patient biopsies, um, and they are um, frozen with, uh, five to ten, within five to ten minutes after excision uh, to preserve any phosphobiomarkers. Uh, then after that, they're uh, formalin fixed and then embedded in paraffin, um, and we perform um, staining. We perform staining on our Leica Bond RX, which is automated and allows us to do uh, high throughput staining. Um, after we stain our tissue, we do whole slide imaging. Um, we're currently working with the Zeiss Axio scan, um, although in previous assays we, we've also stained, um, excuse me, uh, scan slides onto the uh, Perio slide scanner. 
Um, once we've scanned all of our slides and extracted images, we can um, perform quantitative image analysis in the Definions Architect program. And the way that AltaView works in with this is that we have given them some of our reagents and they have performed uh, custom conjugations with their DNA barcoding technology. So the goal of our assay is to um, develop a quantitative multiplex immuno-oncology immunofluorescent assay for CD, CD8 T cells um, in relationship to tumor tissue. So one of the first questions we had to address was how do we define tumor tissue? Uh, we first started, and what I'm showing you on the left is an H&E um, from a tumor microarray of a colorectal cancer. So we had a series of tumor microarrays, and we had a pathologist annotate where the tumor tissue was. And you can see that highlighted in red. And one of our candidates for, to use as a tumor marker was beta-catenin. And you can see that on the left, there's um, this, an adjacent section to the h and &E, see, and that was stained with uh, beta-catenin uh, in the AF488 channel. And the annotations from the h and &E that the pathologist made are overlaid on top of the beta-catenin. And as you can see, the pathologist annotations um, align uh, exactly with um, our beta-catenin staining. So from we, now we did this on a variety of TMAs um, with a variety of uh, tumor types, and we found that uh, beta-catenin is a, we, we could use beta-catenin as a tumor marker. Um, and now why would we want to use a tumor marker when we could normally just um, have a pathologist uh, do our annotations? Well, with this tumor marker, we can do semi-automative um, uh, segmentation of the tumors in our Definions program. And what we, I'm showing on the top here is a monochrome image from one field of one of the biopsies in our tumor microarray. We have an example from colorectal cancer, from breast, and from um, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so the, the, the white is staining for beta-catenin. Um, and then at the bottom, you have a mask that Definions applies based on where the beta-catenin staining is. And based on this mask, which we uh, teach Definions to apply to some of the fields in for our biopsy, we can apply this to the entire um, biopsy and, in effect, categorize um, our biops the tissue in our biopsy as either tumor, tumor or stroma. Uh, some of this work was recently presented at the AACR NCI EORTC 2019 International Conference on Molecular Targets and Cancer Therapeutics. Um, and this work actually will be published soon, um, I believe next month, in uh, Cancer Research in the Supplemental Data section. Um, we will be publishing a paper soon on another assay we developed, and it's um, epithelial mesenchymal transition assay. Um, so um, look for that next month. So once we have um, our tumor marker established, we needed to validate this particular antibody with the AltaView um, bar DNA barcoding technology. So we went back to our tumor microarray, and here we just have some examples of different um, cancers that were in our tumor microarray, and they were stained. Um, this, they were stained with immunohistochemistry techniques with DAB as the chromogen, and then we sent all to view a test lot of our antibody, and then they conjugated it um, with their oligos, and we chose to have this done in the uh, Alexa 4 750 channel. And as you can see, um, the staining by IHC matches exactly with uh, staining um, with the oligo-conjugated antibodies from AltaView. So this was our validation step um, for our uh, tumor marker. And because we have a tumor marker, um, we are able to define tumor margins, and that way we can loc um, define our, in our assay where the T cells are um, in respect to the tumor. So now that we have established our tumor cells, I mean, excuse me, our tumor cell markers, um, we, we will start focusing on our markers for T cell activation. 
So uh, this will be a fiveplex assay, including um, DAPI. Uh, we'll have beta-catenin in the 750 channel, and that will be our tumor marker. And then this assay is focusing on cytotoxic T cells. So our T cytotoxic T cell marker will be CD8, and that's in the AF488 channel. We will have two markers for tumor, tumor uh, sorry, T cell activation. Um, and that will be ZEP70, phosphorylated at tyrosine 493, and that's in the AF647 channel. And at that particular tyrosine is a, the kinase domain of ZEP70. And the other marker will be CD3 zeta, uh, phosphorylated at the 142 uh, tyrosine, and that's in the 546 channel. And that particular tyrosine is um, phosphorylated um, upon in immune synapse formation, and that's at the um, immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motif. And I'll explain um, the rationale for choosing these markers in the next slide. So uh, direct cytolysis of tumor cells by CD of tumor cells by CDA T cells results from the net effect of at least two biochemical pathways. Um, number one is stimulatory signals from activated T cell receptor T cell receptor complexes um, in response to recognition of a tumor neoantigen presented in the context of MHC class one. And you can see that represented on the left of the slide in the blue box. And number two, you also have suppressive signaling from immune checkpoints, such as the response of PD-1 to binding its, its ligand PD-L1. And you can see that pointed out on the extreme left side of the slide um, in the dotted circle. So I have a more detailed version of the immune synapse um, on the right, if you just follow the arrow, the black arrow. Um, this shows involvement of CD3 and CD8. Uh, you have another protein called LCK that's attached to the cytoplasmic tail of CD8. And once you have the formation of and recognition of your peptide in your immune complex, LCK phosphorylates the ITAMs um, of CD3 zeta. And one of those particular ITAMs, which is associated with um, TCR activation, is tyrosine 192, and that's part of our activation panel. Once that tyrosine is phosphorylated, um, that enables ZAP70 to bind through its two tandem SHIP2 domains. And then upon binding, uh, we have activation of ZAP70, and that is caused by the phosphorylation of your tyrosine at 143. And that is also part of our um, T cell activation panel. Uh, so I also mentioned the PD-1 and PD-L1 pathway, and as I'm sure many of you are aware that this pathway has been a target of many clinically successful cancer immunotherapy drugs. Um, so the binding of PD-1 to its ligand modulates TCR signaling, and that modulation also affects ZAP70 and CD3 zeta. So binding of PD-1 ligand to, I'm oh, sorry, binding of PD-L1 to pd one leads to the binding of SHIP2 um, to phosphorylated uh, switch motifs and an overall inhibition of T cell receptor signaling through the inhibition of CD3 zeta and ZAP70 association. So this is why we chose um, ZAP70 phosphorylated at 142 and, oh, I'm sorry, CD3 zeta phosphorylated at 142 and ZAP70 phosphorylated at 493 because they can reflect both the activity of PD, the PD-1 pathway and the TCR signaling pathway. So next I want to move on to um, generating positive controls for our assay. And we also, at this point, need to validate uh, antibodies uh, for uh, our T cell activation panel. Um, and to do this, we decided to use a um, use uh, human uh, PBMCs isolated from healthy donors. So we selected for the CD3 positive PBMCs, and then we stimulated, um, and then we put them in culture, and we stimulated them with dynabeads 
that are conjugated to anti-CD3 and anti-CD28, or and also anti-CD3, CD28, and CD137. Um, this generated, so it, this generated um, our greatest response after uh, with nine and ten days. Um, and as you can see in the top row, um, I'm showing an example of cells that were stained with our T cell activation panel. And this is on day nine. So, um, and if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see where we quantified the, the cells and their staining for our CD8 and the T cell activation panel. Um, so in this way, we, we generated response calibrators for clinical specimens uh, and established what would be a measurable signal for our assay. So um, we would have something as, let's say, a low signal, I mean, a, no signal, which would be day zero, a low signal for day seven, and then high signals on day nine and 10. And then we can incorporate that into our assay as positive controls. So the next step in developing our assay, uh, we had to, uh, we sent over our antibodies that we validated to UltraView for um, barcode conjugation. And in addition, we also spiked them with a, a type a tumor, ACHN tumor cells. Um, so if you want to focus on the upper right-hand panel, um, you can see the tumor cells uh, stained with beta-catenin. And as we would expect, and then we have some cells that are staining for CD8, and then oh, there's cells in there that are also the activated TC, T, excuse me, the activated T cells are staining with um, CD3 zeta. And we observed this in the similar manner that I showed in the previous slide, where you have almost no activated T cells in day zero, and then upon stimulation, um, you see an increase in activation. So our next step in developing the assay um, was actually staining tissue and at the same time establishing positive control tissues for our assay. Um, we decided to use uh, human tonsil as a positive tissue control for the assay, mainly because it's usually filled with um, activated T cells because most of the time when you get your tonsils removed, it's because you have something like tonsillitis. Um, and it's also a very easy source of uh, obtaining positive control tissues. So what I, I'm showing here is an example of a tonsil. Um, you can see that there's CD8 staining around the germinal centers, uh, which you would expect. And, and sorry, these are, um, yes, this is with our olig oligoconjugated antibody. And then in the panel to the right, you can see staining with CD3 zeta, uh, 142. So now that we validated our oligoconjugated antibodies um, on cells and in tissues, we could finally move on um, to feasibility studies in biopsies. So what we did is we acquired um, tumor microarrays from, uh, from a company called Indivimed, and this is a perspective collection because for a lot of these phosphoproteins, um, we we need to collect the tissues need to be frozen within five to ten minutes. Um, after excision. So, and then, and after they're frozen, they need to be, um, of course, fixed and then embedded in paraffin. Um, we have three such TMAs that we acquired. We have one for col colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer. Um, here is an example from a, one of the biopsies from a uh, breast cancer patient, and here it's stained for, we have DAPI in blue, uh, beta-catenin in light blue color, ZEP70 in pink, CD3 zeta in red, and CD8 in green. And I'm going to break down this uh, particular biopsy in the next few slides. So on the leftmost slide, um, we have just the DAPI channel and the CD8 channel. And here you can you can see all of the um, T cells that have that are in our biopsy. Um, and we, when we add another dimension of CD, CD3 zeta142, we can see which cells have become activated. And the activated cells are the cells 
that are staining both for CD8 and CD3 zeta-142, and those are the cells that you can see in yellow. And on the next slide, what we do is when we, when we add beta-catenin, we add another dimension of analysis to this uh, tumor microarray, because we can actually see where our CD8 positive T cells are in respect to the tumor. And as you can see in this particular biopsy, a majority of the CD8 cells are actually found outside of the tumor. And then when you add our CD3 zeta-142 uh, marker, you can see that most of these CD8 cells that are outside of the tumor are, are activated. Uh, so what we do with this information is we, we take these images and then we can actually quantify um, how many CD8 cells are inside the tumor or outside of the tumor and how many of them are activated. And we perform that with the Definions Architect software. So here is just a brief overview of the algorithm that we're using for this assay. Um, as I mentioned before, we use beta-catenin um, to determine location of tumor. So we can categorize pieces of the biopsy as either tumor, the ones that are beta-catenin positive, or stroma. Um, the next level beyond that is we look at CD8 staining so we can determine the location of CD8 positive cells. In addition, Definions also has algorithms that can detect um, nuclei. So um, any nu staining for nuclei that we see must be associated with CD8 staining in order for it to count as a CD8 positive cell. In this way, we don't pick up any you know, random background signals um, and count those as cells. So the next step um, is to define the, cell, the CD8 positive cell as either activated or not activated. Um, and the non-activated would be CD8 single positive, and an activated cell would be CD8 positive and CD3 zeta positive as well. And then we also have another category of cells um, where they would be CD8 negative, and we know the, that it's, there's a cell there because of the nuclear staining, and then some of those cells um, are CD8, sorry, are uh, CD3 zeta positive. So here um, is an example of some of the analysis that we have, we perform in Definions. Um, this is part of the cell classification part of the algorithm. Uh, on the rightmost slide, rightmost image, we have a monochrome in image of the CD8 positive cells. And on the leftmost image, you, we have a monochrome um, image of the CD3 zeta-142 positive cells. Now, the red arrows are pointing to cells that are CD3 zeta single positive, CD3 zeta-142 single positive. Um, oh, I guess I should also describe, um, so those blue outlines you see, that's where um, our Definions algorithm defines the border line of a cell. So each, and this is based on the nuclear staining and our surface marker staining. So each um, border, a blue border you see, is actually is is a cell, and that, and Definions counts that as as one cell. So you can see um, the red arrows; those are pointing to cells that are CD3 zeta 142 single positive. And if you look at the corresponding arrows in the other image, you can see that it's um, it's, you can see a signal for CD3 zeta and then look at that other corresponding cell um, in the CD8 image and see that there's no staining there. Um, and then if you look in the center image, um, that particular cell will be kind of like a mustardy, dull yellow color. Um, and then the yellow arrows are pointing to cells that are both CD8 positive and CD3 zeta-142 positive. And if you follow that same yellow arrow into the center image, you can see that those uh, cells are highlighted in yellow. And those are the cells that uh, Definions counts as CD8 positive and CD, CD8 positive and CD3 zeta142 positive, positive. And those are uh, activated. What we are counting as activated T cells. So I want to show you what this looks like. On our, TM, on our TMAs. So we have three TMAs that we, uh, from Definions, I mean, sorry, three TMAs 
Uh, we have our colorectal cancer TMA, our non-small lung, non lung cancer TMA, and then our uh, breast cancer TMA. And here I'm showing you one of the biopsies from the colorectal cancer TMA. Um, in light blue is our beta-catenin, and in red is our CD3 zeta-142 positive cells, and in green are CD8 positive cells. And I have um, this blue box, is an in, in insert in here that's a blown up portion of our TMA where you can actually see uh, individual uh, tumor infiltrating leukocytes that are, that are in the stroma um, and or in the, uh, the tumor, which is defined by beta-catenin. So uh, this, and then we, the graph on the uh, rightmost side of the slide is the quantification of all of these uh, tumor infiltrating leukocytes. Um, we have a uh, majority of the double positive, the CD8 and CD3 zeta double positive cells, and then the CD3 positive, sorry, the CD3 zeta 142 positive cells are in the stroma. And then uh, there are some cells also in the tumor. I and mean, just to get a feel for how much tissue we're covering in just a small biopsy, um, there we counted a total of 4,587 nuclei. Uh, and about 50% of those nuclei were stroma, and then 50% of those uh, were tumor. And I have another example of a, another biopsy that we analyzed. Um, this is from the uh, non-small lung cell cancer. And as you can see in this particular biopsy, uh, you have cells that are both, cells that are both in the stroma and in the tumor. Um, and in this particular case, which we didn't have in the previous example, you can see uh, in green that there are, there are, those are non-activated CD8 uh, T cells. And as you can see in the insert, I'm, I'm pointing out some cells that are in uh, the tumor layer and then some cells that are also, let's, like that one cell in red, pointed out by the red arrow that's in the, um, the stroma. And again, we're able to quantify uh, what's happening in the biopsy. And also, if you, if you look at this TMA by eye, what you're seeing in the graph matches, which is, which is an important um, part of our assay. We, we want to make sure that what, what you see by eye matches with uh, the quantification. So here we have one more example um, from our breast cancer TMA. Uh, where we have actually about an equal number of pills in the stroma and in the tumor. Uh, and you can see that reflected in the graph. And a majority of the T, um, a majority of the cells are um, CD3 zeta 142 single positive. And then the next most prevalent population are the double positive activated T cells, the CD3 zeta, CD8 positive, CD3 zeta 142 positive cells. So the next slide is an example of all the data, is an example of some of the data that we can generate from our assay. And we have examples from four different TMAs. Um, uh, on the slide that we actually analyzed, uh, we had about 64 biopsies per TMA. Um, so th this assay can have a, a very high, very high throughput. Um, and all the, you know, the, on the TMAs that we analyzed, uh, we, we were able to analyze them at, you know, a variety of stages. We have anything from stage one up to stage four. Um, so we're hoping to see that, um, oh, so the type of data that we, that we were able to generate, oh, there's a number of nuclei in the biopsy, the number of nuclei in the stroma, and then the tumor, and then we, we have, um, generate numbers of CD8 positive, CD3 zeta negative cells, and then double positive cells, and then CD3 zeta single positive cells. And, and we are hoping that um, when we apply this assay to samples from clinical trials, that in patients where we're seeing, um, you know, a positive response to the cancer therapy, 
to the cancer immunotherapy that we may see changes in some of these um, T cell activation numbers. So in summary, we've developed a robust 5-plex quantitative multiplex immunofluorescence assay um, that enumerates CD8 positive cells and classifies them by activation status. We've developed algorithms in Definian's architect to quantify activated CD8 positive T cells excuse me, to quantify activated CD8 positive T cells both inside tumor tissues and as well as in the surrounding stroma using beta catenin segmentation in colorectal cancer, non-small lung cell cancer, and breast cancer TMA samples. Um, this assay is being used for pharmacodynamic evaluations and ongoing immunotherapy clinical trials, and as soon as the assay is ready, it will be made available to the public, and that's the website where you can find this assay and all the other in, in the future, and um, you can also view all the other assays that we've developed. So um, I just want to thank everyone at AltaView uh, for working with us and generating all of our oligoconjugated antibodies. And I wanted to thank um, everyone that I work with at Lidos. Um, so uh, questions? OK, thank you, Dr. Fino. The audience has submitted several questions, so uh, let's get to them. Is, um, this is a question for the AltaView team for, uh, for Dr. Downing. Um, does the AltaView Services Lab develop mouse panels? So we actually will take on um, the projects to actually develop panels in mice. Uh, there are a couple caveats to that. Um, as we know, a lot of the immunological markers in mice and humans are not necessarily conserved uh, all that well. So the caveat to that is that there has to be a good antibody. And one of the recommendations that we make is that the antibody was raised in rabbit and directed specifically against the mouse antigen. Uh, so with that caveat, yes, we will take on the development of mouse panels. OK, great. And um, Dr. Downen, is there an option to transfer assays from AltaView to our lab to run in-house? Yes, that option exists. It's basically done on a, a project level. Uh, this is not something which would be economical for either of us if you're looking just to stay in a handful of slides. Uh, but if you have a large project uh, that would require you know, a few hundred slides or more, uh, that's something that we absolutely would consider. OK, great. Um, Dr. Fino, I believe this question is for you. Um, what other technologies were considered to develop the multiplex panel? Oh, we also considered um, conjugating our antibodies with haptins like uh, DNP and DIG and biotin. Um, but we ultimately decided to go with AltaView because um, we were, because of the magnification of the signal. Uh, some of the uh, phosphoproteins that we're looking for are not very intense signals. So AltaView helped us, you know, it, essentially it, it's like we're, we're getting the same type of signal magnification as you would with an IHC. So um, the, that's why we decided to, to go with AltaView as opposed to, you know, like uh, Hapton conjugated antibodies. Okay, great. Th those Thank are you. the main. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, and what's the future direction of this work? What comes next? I'm sorry, is it that's a question for me? What's the future direction of? Uh, yeah. So, what's the future direction of your work, and what comes next? Oh, well, we're developing this assay for um, uh, clinical trials that are patients that are on immunotherapy. Um, we can't really discuss the clinical trials that we'll be working on, but that's the direction of the assay. Um, uh, you know, we have a few other markers that we, we may add to our assay. OK, great. Um, this is the next question for Dr. Downing. Do you have a kit or method for resolving M1 versus M2 macrophage cells? So we don't have a kit for that at the moment. Um, I'll just say stay tuned. OK, great. 
Um, this is another question for you, Dr. Downing. Um, do you disclose which PDL1 antibodies that you, you use? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so those uh, individuals who actually purchase the kit uh, who are, or have a services uh, contract will actually um, know the clones that are actually being used in, in the kits and in the assays. It's not something we generally uh, tell the public uh, openly, but um, the kits, you know, people will get the kits who have, the, uh, have service projects performed to actually get the, all the list of the clones that are actually used. Um, there are a number of PDL1 clones out there available. Um, we actually do use um, one of the ones that was used in the Blueprint project. Um, so with that, if you know anybody else has any further questions, they can always reach out. Of course, yeah. Um, this is another question for you, Dr. Downing. Um, is there an option to use either Ventana or DACO clones? So the use of clones is really restricted um, in terms of the ability to obtain the clone. So typically the antibody clone has to be, be able to be obtained in a carrier-free format. So that means it doesn't have any additional proteins in it like the SA. And additionally, it should be at a relatively high concentration for um, conjugation. Now, a lot of the clones uh, from Ventana are pre-diluted uh, and they're not available in concentrated forms. And some of the Agilent clones or DACO clones, um, some are and some are not. So it really depends on the availability of the actual antibody uh, in the format it's available from the vendor. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Fino, I believe this question is for you. Um, how thick were the FFP sections? Uh, they were at four microns, and we also can do them at two microns. Okay, great. And we have uh, another question for you, Dr. Downing. Um, how many incubation steps are there, and what is the stop or stopping time of the chromogenic step? I'm sorry, I don't really fully understand the question. Um, you know, there's an incubation time for the primary antibodies, uh, for the the elongation or the amplification of the um, barcodes, and then there's an incubation step for the addition of the probes. Um, it's not a chromogenic assay, it's a multiplex immunofluorescence. Uh, the whole assay from start to finish, that which includes the um, de-waxing of your slides and, and answering retrieval takes just over five hours. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and that's all we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speakers directly. Their emails are shown on the screen. And as a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Sean Downing and Dr. Kristen Fino, as well as our webinar sponsor, Autoview Inc. Thanks everyone and goodbye.